and welcome to worship on this July 11th, 2021. Our service begins this morning with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Gathered together this morning and drawn to Christ, we are here seeking God's great abundance, and so let us begin by confessing our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. So turn us again to you, gracious God. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in this world. Beloved people of God, Jesus, who is the manna from heaven, feeds and nourishes you. By Jesus, who is the great worker of miracles, there is always more than enough for you. Through Jesus, who is the bread of life, you are shown and you are granted God's great mercy. You are forgiven and you are loved into abundant life. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. King Herod heard of the disciples preaching for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother, and when his disciples had heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Psalm 
So, Kate's cousin, Tony, many years ago decided to pursue his deepest ambition and his dreams. Now, I have a cousin, Tony. Kate has a cousin, Tony. Maybe all of us have a co cousin named Tony, but Kate's cousin, Tony, moved to Los Angeles a number of years ago. And he moved to Los Angeles. Uh, he's a bartender out there. He's a personal trainer out there, but he moved there primarily to be in TV shows and in movies. He wanted to be an actor. And this was his dream, and he moved to Los Angeles to pursue it. Now, if any of you know somebody who's in the newspaper or makes an appearance on the nightly news, you know, in the background cheering, or uh, if you know anybody who's acted in movies or is in things, if you know somebody who has a performance, it, it makes you interested in what they've been in and kind of leads you to watch it, right? So Kate's cousin Tony has been in a few TV shows, a few commercials, movies, and Kate and I have watched these because there's something about like watching this person that you know and being like, oh, that's somebody you know. And I have to tell you that one of the things that Kate's cousin Tony was in was a movie a few years ago when this fad was going on uh, that was on the sci-fi channel and Kate's cousin Tony was in this movie and it was called Sharktopus versus Terracuda. Man, what fine film and cinema. Uh, filled with CGI, made for a TV movie, uh, following this fad of like sharks that are become monstrous and attack people. And uh, Tony, Kate's cousin Tony, was in this movie. Because we know him, we have to watch the movie, right? So I think of this every time the gospel story tells the account or recounts the thing uh, that this morning's gospel lesson recounts. Every time I get to this part of scripture, I think of Kate's cousin Tony and this Sharktopus movie that he's in. It's a weird connection. It's not even a movie I would have seen, but you have to watch it when you know the person, right? And I've told this story to you all, the people of St. Stephen, once before, so maybe you remember it. But I can't help myself but to think of this when we get to this account, the one that's told to us today from the sixth chapter of Mark. So Kate and I watched Sharktopus versus Terracuda. It's kind of embarrassing, I guess, to admit that I've watched this, but we watched it because Kate's cousin Tony is in it. And in the movie, Kate's cousin plays the lifeguard. And uh, he jet skis around, and at one point, and it's maybe only halfway through the movie, uh, Tony is on the jet ski, and the character that he's playing is saying, you've got to watch out, Terracuda's coming. You know, clear the beaches, Terracuda's coming. And you've seen these movies, so you can kind of picture what's going on. Uh, watch out, Terracuda's coming, and he's on this jet ski, and this terribly CGI'd uh, Terracuda monster flies by, and Tony is decollated. He's decollated. You know what this word decollate, decollation means? Kate's cousin was beheaded right before our eyes. So every time this account comes up in the sixth chapter, of Mark or comes up elsewhere in the Bible or this story comes up somewhere, I, for some reason, picture Kate's cousin. John the Baptist is the cousin of Jesus. That's not told to us in Mark. It's told to us elsewhere in the Bible. But this is a sort of background thing that I know. So Jesus' cousin is decollated and Kate's cousin is decollated. The maybe different circumstances, but for whatever reason, those two things come together and lead me to think about what it is that causes us to lose our head. What is it that causes us to lose our head? And this sort of goes two directions. At this point, uh, the world's filled with uh, an ongoing amount of stress and trying to rebuild and try to get yours and get back to where you want to be. And the world is trying to wake up, but it doesn't feel the same and it's so stressful. And boiling right under the surface is this sort of habit I can sometimes barely contain, which is the habit to lose my head. And that comes to mind when I think of all this. Is there uh, a thing in particular that causes you to maybe lose your head? 
And I think once I've gotten to that place and I've lost control, I've lost my head, uh, sometimes I look and feel and maybe even say things to people that's almost as if I would want them to be decolated. Like, how dare you do that? Uh, I've lost my head in anger and as a consequence, I'm so frustrated you should lose your head. And this is sort of the chaos of the world that we live in. This is where we're at. Last week after worship, a member came up to me and was chatting with me and he said, what is it with people? What is it with people? And I can tell you that part of me identifies with that. For whatever reason, for whatever amount of stress, or whatever it is that's going on, my ability to cope is less, and it's easier for me to lose my head at this point than maybe it's ever been. And not only is it easy for me to lose my head, but to look at people and sort of treat them like I want them to be decolated, like I would like their heads to be lopped off. And this is sort of where I'm at. And so this guy was talking to me after church, uh, last Sunday, and he said that he, uh, just a few days before, had been going down the road, and he didn't think he was going all that slowly, but he was moving, and the person behind him uh, was being held up, or felt like they were being held up, and he began to lose his head, this person behind him, and he's getting angry, and so this guy tapped his brakes and was trying to move over, and that just infuriated this person behind him even more, and so he flew past him, and it involved all sorts of, sorts of hand motions, which you can imagine, and yelling and screaming. He lost his head. And man, it seems like uh, this happens easily these days. And not only did he lose his head, but then he traveled around this person. You know, he didn't just pass and move on with his life, but he continued to make hand motions and ride by him and yell at him and do all this stuff so that he lost his head and he wanted this other person to lose his head. What is it that causes you to lose your head? Are you with me on the thin patience thing? And have you ever felt what it's like to lose your head and become so sort of angry, even maybe sometimes over small things, that you treat other people like they need to be decolated? Kate's cousin Tony was decolated by Shark Dakota? Sorry, Terracuda, whatever. Today's account from the sixth chapter of Mark is all about head loss. And when this comes up in the scripture, I can't help but think about our patience and how easy it is for us to lose our heads. And how when we lose our heads, it becomes a situation where we treat other people like they don't deserve to have theirs. And so this is what I'm thinking about. Has this ever happened to you? Have you ever lost your head? And have you ever gone down the path of maybe being more angry or fearful or towards somebody than maybe you should have been? Let's think for a second. Have you ever sat? Do you know how to sit? Have you ever walked? How do you feel about walking? Do you know how to do that? Have you ever eaten? Do you eat? Do you sit, walk, and eat? And when I ask about that, I'm not just asking about whether you sit, walk, or eat, but I'm asking if you've ever sort of cleared your mind and been present with the acts of sitting and walking and eating. To not let your head be filled with all sorts of stuff and just run away with itself, but have you ever taken a moment and been present in the idea of just sitting? Maybe it's a something that didn't go right and so you're forced to wait and so you're sitting and you've ever been fully present in sitting where you just take a breath and try to clear your mind where you try to keep your head uh, maybe you go for a walk and in going for a walk you set aside all of the stuff that has our patience worn so thin have you ever gone for a walk and not just walk like to walk but been present in a walk and in eating, have you ever sat down and appreciated what you have and been fully present in eating? Because the opposite of losing our head or you know, yelling at other people is being fully present in simple, easy places. And all of this comes to mind because I've read through and I've just read for you the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. This is the story of the dancing daughter. Now, one of the things that's uh, sort 
sort of difference about this gospel text is that Jesus' name is in the text, but he's not a character in it at all. This is rare when we have a gospel reading, that this isn't really about Jesus. Uh, this is more about the background of who Jesus is, and it's maybe speaking a little bit more to the shared reality of being human. It's a little less about God and what God does for us, more than it's an account about the circumstances that we tend to find ourselves into. It tends to try to show uh, or put a light on uh, the reality of living and maybe kind of steer us away from the bad parts of it and into the good parts. One of the ways that this scripture does this is that it bounces around. Last week, Jesus went back to his hometown. He can perform no miracles there. He commissions the 12. And then we get this story jammed in there about the declaration of John the Baptist, a story that foreshadows Jesus' own death, and it foreshadows the consequences of living among other people for you and me, even to this day. But this story is jammed in here. The 12, next week, in next week's Gospel reading, are going to return from the sending Jesus sent from last week. But this week, we get this jammed-in, chaotic story that just sort of crops up. And man, can that try your patience when a thing just sort of crops up. This is a story about humanity and about the difficulty of living well. It's about the difficulty of living a God-centered, peace-oriented life in such a chaotic, uh, uncontrollable world. And it's about us living with all the terracudas out there that would take our head from us. It's about the thin patience that we have left and sort of the consequences of losing our heads and decollating others when we've lost our heads. If you'd like, you can follow along with me because I'm going to move my way down through some of the verses for a few minutes to sort of give a background of the story of humanity that's being shared here. In verse 14, we're introduced to Herod. Herod is this Herod, is Herod the Great, one of the sort of well-known leaders uh, of the people of Israel. This is his son. When Herod the Great died, uh, all of his kingdom was divided up into portions, and each of his sons were given one of the portions. And this is Herod Antipas, one of Herod the Great's sons, and he's got a little section of the bigger section. And this verse also gives us some connection to Jesus. It mentions him, so it tries to tie it into the greater story of the gospel. It hints at one of the things that causes the loss of one's head and is involved when we want other people to lose their head because how could they do that to me? It hints a little bit at guilt. I've already talked about the chaotic structure of this story where it's bouncing around and that of course leads to thin patients being tried and the terracudas of life ripping our heads off. This also hints at the idea of being raised from the dead about a new possibility it hints at John the Baptist coming back to life. It foreshadows that Jesus does. And it talks to us about life being somewhere else other than these deadly things that occupy us and cause us to lose our head. In verse 15, it talks about prophets. Prophets are people who move through a time of personal hardship, have God speak to them, are clear on who God wants them to be and who try to live in the world uh, of sharktopuses and terracudas and all this head loss and anger and guilt and chaos in a way that's grounded and peaceful. Prophets are people that just want to sit, walk, eat, and be fully present in a world that keeps trying to make you not be those things. And so this, in verse 15, introduces prophets and talks again about some of the difficulty of being a prophet and living a godly life in a terracuda world. In verse 16, we get the actual decollation, uh, and there's this hint again of raising, and it, there's some background there of some other kind of life, a movement to a new place, and how uh, we'd have to give up the world we have and how hard that is. 
there's some background here again of guilt and consequences and the main part here is the loss of one's head and other people but it's sort of giving the background of this shared humanity of wanting to be something else uh, but how hard it is to get there and guilt and it gives us a lot to think about what is it that leads to the loss of our head what is it that causes us to lose our head what is it that tries our patience and what causes one person once they've lost their head to live in this sort of anger and animosity towards others that's so venomous that you would have them lose their head as well some of the hints or the things to think about about that are in today's gospel in verse 17 in mark 6 17 there is uh, some background here of the practice of endogamy endogamy is the practice of people who are rich powerful uh, royalty kind of people like Herod Antipas marrying within their own family now the reason why royalty is inclined to marry within its own family is because it wants to keep the land the power the money that it has and so this is another one of those background things the keeping of what's yours that sort of hints at what leads to the loss of one's head and the anger uh, that makes us want to lash out at other people and dogamy and the politics that are at play are what's talked about in verse 17 and in verse 18 we have John who wants to believe that God's creation is about more than head loss and he won't just wink wink nod nod look at Herod and, and his closed system and his politics and settle for it. Now, to me, he's sitting in the present. He's walking in the present. He's eating in the present. He's being who God called him to be. But there is some hint here of how much work and how much a call to be an agent of sort of God in the midst of the world is hard. And that's some of what's going on in verse 18. In verse 19, we're given a word that I think is an important word to hold on to today. That's maybe right at the core of head loss, our own and the loss of others. That word is the word grudge. Are you holding a grudge against yourself for anything? Have you been so bothered by somebody else or has someone else done something to you that you're holding on to a grudge? Perhaps this is right at the center of what would move us from being able to sit, to eat, to walk, to be present peacefully and moves us into a world of head loss and grudges and grudge is an important word here. Do you feel affected and is there a grudge that might pull you away from keeping your head? can see in verse 19 uh, a lot of the layers and the complication that's at work, the politics. Uh, and then we move into verse 20 where fear seems to be introduced and seems to be part of this. And of course, the loss of one's head and the anger that leads to wanting someone else to lose their head. How dare you tap your brakes and move to the side? I'm in a hurry and so I'm going to drive. All this decollating stuff at the heart of it is fear and lack of control and uh, these layers and verse 20 talks about that in verse 21 uh, there's some language here about seeing an opportunity and taking it now that is the same language that's used about Judas later that Judas sees an opportunity to betray Jesus that once this head loss has happened, this word opportunity, this uh, opportunism has sort of leapt on, uh, where John sort of sits and walks and eats and lives an entire lifestyle, there's this sort of opportunism that leads to lost heads. And by the way, with this declaration, think of what a head is. A head is sort of the seat of our thinking, rational being we've lost it we've lost rational thought we've lost uh, being able to maybe think through things well with people and that's part of what's being lost in this story and that's part of what's being lost in the midst of the world that we live in a 
lost head as an unthinking person. It's an unpresent, unengaged person. Uh, the head is also the thing that goes first, you know, head of the class. And so you've lost the sort of front end uh, background sort of work. In verse 22, uh, we're given uh, an issue where some of our uh, emotions or things that we push down, uh, a part of our humanity that we don't talk about a lot, uh, comes to the fore. And there's this sort of uh, sexuality present in this part of the story and how sometimes sexuality can be a deceit of the loss of our thinking self. There's some... Uh, this exotic thing and different thing and new thing and there's some sexuality and then there's this endogamy at play here uh, where there's interrelating and intermarriage in these families and all that's happening in verse 22. Verse 23 talks about uh, how exorbitant uh, power and, what, and esteem and the politics is exorbitant and they're trying to cling on to it and that wanting to cling to those things has led to maybe this loss of control and what leads to declaration and that this is the opposite of the sitting walking and eating that presentness and God calls us to verse 24 deals with uh, some of the layers a head is the seat of knowledge it's at the forefront and that's being talked again about again in verse 24. In verse 25, uh, I can show you how sort of snowball and how out of control losing one's head gets because now uh, Salome, the daughter uh, who's traditionally named Salome, uh, adds the, pl the platter into the story. Remember, uh, when the head is initially being called for, there was no platter and now it's being added in. This is just a snowballing loss of control and that is sort of so typical of head loss Incidentally, uh, putting John the Baptist's head on a platter might be a sort of foreshadow of Jesus sitting on a platter in the Eucharist for us. In verse 26, we see uh, grief, we see stress and being worked up, and we see how emotional and out of control headlessness is. Verse 27 is the decalation itself. Verse 28 talks about how strange things have become now. The gifts that are being given are weird. People's heads are lost and other people's heads are being taken off. And now we're just in this weird sort of surreal place. And we just wish we could have be back to the place where sitting and walking and eating in full presence would be what we have. In verse 29, there's the tomb, which equals death. And when we lose our heads, and when we call for the loss of other people's heads, death is surely the consequence. This foreshadows Jesus, but it talks about our shared stuckness as people. The temptation to lose our heads, to attack, uh, is uh, a consequence of the life of death and loss. It's the consequence of politics and sexuality and trying to cling to whatever power we have. It is the consequence of not sitting while fully present and relaxing one's mind. It is the consequence of walking but not truly walking, of eating but only caring about other things. It is what happens in a terracuda world. So the question becomes, thought about Cousins Tony and movies and the person here who uh, felt like what it feels like to deal with a person who's lost their head and is so angry they want to chop off yours and having worked our way through uh, the background and some of the humanity of Mark 6 and having landed in a place where headlessness, the loss of our head and the call for other people to lose their head is death. I finally get to the point. I will openly admit to you that my patients are so thin that it's so easy for me to feel like the world is chaotic and that it's political and that there's all these layers and it's become really easy for other people to do tiny things in my midst and, and for me to lose my head. 
Do we believe that that it really is grudge holding and anger, uh, death? Do you believe that this is what's taking full life from us? Do you believe, do you follow the thinking of this gospel that defines loss of one's head and the call to chop off someone's other head, someone else's head? Do you believe what that is diagnosing as our own death? I sit before that and have my eyes opened and hear that this sort of anger and loss of control is the tomb. And so it arrives and brings me and you together to the gospel moment, to the moment that we've considered all this for. Have you ever lost your head? Have you ever acted as though you wanted someone else to lose theirs? Do you hold grudges? Do you insist upon living in this world? Do we believe that that's a world of death and it's a world that's life-taking? Do we believe that all the terracudas that would behead us are life-taking in the tomb? And do you gather before God's word and God's presence this morning because you believe that death shall not define you any longer. Are you here because you want to sit and to walk and to eat simple things, not sitting with your mind racing and being lost, not walking while holding grudges, not eating in anger, but do you gather before God because you believe in life because you believe in sitting and walking and eating and that being present in those things meditatively and calmly are life given. This is a story about what takes life. It's a description of the loss of head and the, and the looking at anger at other people so that you want them to lose it too. And it sort of reminds us that our life is a life of mindfulness. It's our head being the center of and forefront of who we are, and that full life is to be found here. Do you hold a grudge? This week, if you would like to move from death to life, I would like you to take some sort of piece of paper, a card, and to think about what takes life from you. What takes your life from you? What angers you? What's a thing that would take your life from you? And I'd like for you to write that on this card. Maybe you're holding a grudge against somebody, and I'd like for you to uh, put that on this card. And then I would like for you to take it, and I would like to, for you at some point today or this week, understand that this mindlessness is death that God's call to peace and to abundant life is to sit, to walk, and to eat mindfully. So I would like for you to literally take that grudge or that thing that uh, is overwhelming you and tear it up and clear your mind and to sit in a place that's centered and the place where God sets you. My hope is is that at some point today or this week, you can sit, you can walk, you can eat, and you can be fully present in those things. It is so easy at this point to lose our heads and to attack others like we want them to lose their heads. The Tony moments are so easy. But our freedom today is a movement away from that. My hope was is if you could take your card and write down a thing that angers you or a grudge that you're holding and then tear it up, that you can literally tear it up and set it aside and sit in a moment of life and peacefulness. Take the time to sit, to walk, to eat, to fully be present in those activities with your mind empty of all the things that are running away with it and to make space for God's presence. It'll reduce your stress. It'll bring you life. 
and it'll make your week so much more full. It'll ground you in Christ, and it will help you live out what it truly means to be a child of God. Head attached, head included. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ.